Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for lessons on how to lead and how to uh, support and follow our godly leaders. I thank you that you sent a man like Nehemiah so far to do such a great work. And you made, uh, you took care to make sure that somebody would write this down for us, Father, for in this man's life we see so many examples that remind us and teach us on so many levels of how to be the person you would care for us to be and, and how leaders are to be in, our, in their positions of authority. And, Father, the world is, is filled with men who distort these things and who follow other models, ungodly ones. And so often, Lord, we, we assume that is the only way a leader will be, that, that power will always corrupt. And yet you see in this man an opportunity to teach us of how a humble heart of a man who's led by the Spirit and comes to you in prayer, who knows your word and is concerned for your people, how someone in that way can uh, take such a different approach, such a loving one and such a godly one. We ask, Father, that not only would we learn about this man and what he did, but that you would send us men who do the same today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 6 of Nehemiah. We have gotten to the point where Nehemiah has successfully defended the city and the people from a series of attacks that we studied in the preceding chapters, both attacks from outside the city, from the enemies in the surrounding land, and from attacks inside the city. The neighboring Gentiles attacked the city with military might. They did some damage, as you remember, but they were not able to fully conquer the city. Nehemiah caused the people to regroup. And they defended it. And then the enemy began to stir up Jews from within the city and they attacked through complaints of unfair treatment. One set of Jews enslaving another through deaths and the like. Once again, though, Nehemiah stepped in. We saw last week he righted those wrongs and he brought the people back together again. So in all cases, we see the Lord working through Nehemiah to hold this group together and to keep the work going. The operation of Nehemiah in leading the people and the whole effort of them rebuilding this wall has been described as a triumph of focus and determination. Because at every turn, they aren't just challenged by the rebuilding effort, they're challenged by the enemy who would come in in various ways through their flesh or through the world and all that it offers to distract them and stop them from the building. This happens any time you have people working in leadership, especially when the Lord is working to restore us. Remember, this whole story is a story of the nation of Israel being disciplined and then being brought back into fellowship with God through a series of steps of restoration. Anytime you see God taking someone who has been rebellious and moves them through a series of things to bring them back into a walk with him, there's going to be a battle from start to finish in that process. The enemy doesn't give ground easily. So when we make it our point to walk back with the Lord, you can bet the enemy is going to do anything he can to prevent that. If it's not our flesh drawing us back into the way we used to sin, it'll be the world tempting us to replace the Lord's priorities with his own. And if it's not the world, it'll be the enemy's schemes and his temptations. And if it's not the enemy, it'll be our brothers and sisters in the Lord often who contend with us or our leaders who disappoint us or whatever it may be. The fact that restoring fellowship with the Lord can be so difficult is a lesson in itself of the importance of abiding in Christ in the first place. Because there is such a difficult road to hoe in getting back to that place. Last week we ended chapter 5 with the people refocused and the enemies of Israel still trying, still seeking a way to prevent the wall from going up to defend the city. Now, in chapter 6, we move into a new set of lessons, again, on how godly leaders respond to these trials of one kind or another as they lead God's people and as God's people are called to obedience. And this is an interesting chapter. There's some very relevant things, as I said earlier. There are some immediate applications, I think, to everyone here. Look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Now, when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, to Geshem, the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, then Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Shepharim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? They sent messages to me four times in this manner, and I answered them in the same way. With the wall finished, Israel's enemies are running out of options. This much is clear, right? Once you have a wall up, now the city is much more easily defended. The only thing they've left to do is put the gates into the gaps in the wall where the gates are to stand. Now, while those gates are absent, it means that you can still walk in and out of the city freely 
And the enemies of Israel are going to use this limited opportunity to pay visit to Nehemiah by way of a messenger. Sambalat, Tobiah and Geshem and other enemies were told, send a message to Nehemiah through a messenger. And the message says, let's have a meeting. They asked Nehemiah to travel to a place called Ono. It's a plain about 25 miles due west of Jerusalem, uh, right near the Mediterranean Sea. It's near the present day city of Tel Aviv. At the time of this, it was a no man's land. It sat right on the border between Judah and Samaria, and it was in a remote location. So it was a bit of a lawless place. It was way out of the way and far from the reaches of other authorities. And they tell Nehemiah, this is where we want to meet you. Then they specify a place called Shepherim. The word Shepherim is a plural word for village in Hebrew, villages. So it may just describe the collection of towns that were in this plain. It may not be the name of an actual location. But interestingly, it can also be translated with the lions, which might be an apt description of what would happen to Nehemiah should he go there. (laughs) And naturally, Nehemiah recognizes that this is a trap and that if he were to go, they're planning to ambush him or kill him or hurt him in some way. And if he went to this place, he'd likely never return. Furthermore, even if he did manage to escape their grasp by some measure, by the time he returned from what would be a four-day round trip, The enemies of Israel would have had time to attack the city once more and perhaps destroy it, given that they would lack a leader to contend with the attack. I mean, without Nehemiah sustaining and leading the people, which we've already seen him doing in the prior attacks, they're likely to crumble in the face of any attack. It seemed like they didn't hold up very well without him there leading them on. So he wisely avoids the trap and he says to them, I'm just too busy to meet you, which is not a lie in their attempts to draw him away. The enemies of Israel recognized that he was the key to the people's success. And that's a truth, generally speaking. Leaders exist in the body of Christ in our day today for a reason. We might like to think that because every Christian is led by the same spirit, we're all equally capable of leading ourselves. And therefore, we don't have need. We're like a commune. We don't really have need for those to stand up in front of us and be leaders. But if that were true, the Lord would never have appointed 12 apostles from amongst all of his disciples and then empowered them to go off and lead the church. Self-evidently, God chooses to work through men and women, but work through leaders who have a role to play in the people of God. The truth is God makes distinctions among men and women for good reason. He assigns some the responsibility to shepherd his sheep, feeding them so they can grow spiritually and others to guard the flock, making them to pass under the rod, so to speak, leading them into an eternal reward for their obedience. And while we might rightly avoid those who attempt to lord over us by assuming too much power in the body of Christ, and there are certainly men like that, then it's also true, and I think we should acknowledge, that we might also have need for strong servant leaders who model Christ from time to time, shouldn't we? And that they would call us to follow and obey his word. So while we avoid some, we need others. The enemy certainly understands this, as is evident by the fact that he knows where to attack. He makes a point to attack the head of every congregation as often as he can, because that's the easiest way to get to the rest. Those attacks will always be more severe and more persistent if that leader is particularly effective in carrying out God's commands. It's a brilliant strategy, and it's one the enemy has long used. Attack at the strongest point, not the weakest point, because if the strongest defender fails, then you won't even have to fight at the weak points. The very first attack of the enemy was follow that exact pattern. The enemy set his eyes on defeating woman. Woman put up a fight, defending the Lord through his word, those without sufficient understanding to recognize what was going on and to deal with the enemy's deception. But at least she tried. Once the enemy had defeated woman, he didn't even bother with Adam. He was a given. Adam was clearly the weak link in the chain, because as we saw in the story, as soon as the wife handed him the fruit, he took it. There was no need for deception. There was no need for the enemy's schemes. He fought the hard one first because the easy one was in the bag. Unfortunately, over the centuries, a lot of men and some women have fallen to the enemy's schemes, much like the woman in the garden. They've fallen for the same reason the woman fell, because they didn't recognize the enemy's techniques. They didn't learn how to defend against them. They weren't ready to deal with the sophistication of those attacks. And in this chapter, you're going to see three different ways, three distinct ways in which the enemy will work to defeat the leader of any group so as to bring the rest of the group down with him or her. So in verses 1 through 4, we see the first of these. The first of these three styles of attack. In this case, you're watching the enemy seek to distract 
or deceive the leader, Nehemiah, into letting his guard down and making a misstep. In this case, in Nehemiah's situation, the deception was to lead him to think that a compromise with the enemy was possible. That would have been the reason for the meeting. The reason for the meeting is a bit of a negotiation opportunity or a chance to to break bread and let's settle our differences or whatever might have been implied. Perhaps they hoped Nehemiah was tired of the fighting. Or perhaps they hoped that Nehemiah had a weak spot for being liked or being honored or being flattered. That if he accepted the overture, that he would then be seen as a peacemaker, that he might seek for himself some kind of title and, and so on. In the end, they were hoping he could be deceived and he could be distracted from his task. If we had a dollar for every church leader who succumbed to the enemy's deceptions and distractions, we could buy the temple. Pastors have traded the pulpit to run for public office, to run a corporation, to promote best-selling books or campaign for social causes. Others have remained in the pulpit, but they become distracted in their message. They preach prosperity. They preach social equality, they preach health and healing, or they just resort to entertaining the crowds, and they become more attracted to the prospect of being attractive than they do to preaching Christ and Him crucified. Elders, deacons, teachers, Sunday school leaders and the like have set aside their calling and their diligence because the enemy dangled some shiny object in their path at some point in their life and they ran off after it. A promotion at work, a new girlfriend, a midlife crisis, whatever came along and led them to think that was a more attractive pursuit than remaining on the task God gave them, which has eternal implications. The defense to distraction and deception is focus and understanding the enemy's schemes. The men and women who lead us in one context or another have to be people who wake up every day reaffirming their personal commitment to the hard work of ministry. And when something intriguing comes along, they need to be wise enough to suspect this is not a coincidence and that the enemy is behind it and that such things are in their path for a reason, as a test, not to draw them off the task. And that the Lord allows these things, allows the enemy a degree of freedom so that our hearts may be tested in that way. We need to be in prayer for our leaders, that they not take those exit ramps that the enemy puts in their way. We want leaders who will make the kind of sacrifice that serving the Lord requires because they make those sacrifices for us, for our sake, in the way that they can influence our own godliness. So it's in our best interest to pray for them to remain strong against deceptions of one kind or another, distractions of all kinds. And the world is full of them. Now we're going to move to the second technique. That's the first, distraction or deception. Now the second, another very common technique, dishonoring or discrediting the leader. In verses 5 through 7, then Sambalat sent his servant to me in the same manner a fifth time with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations and Gashmu says that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. Therefore, you are rebuilding the wall and you are to be their king. According to these reports, you have also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you. A king is in Judah and now it will be reported to the king according to these reports. So come now, let us take counsel together. Now, this sounds related to the first attempt because we're still hearing him say, come meet and let's have counsel. And then certainly that's still something he's working on. He hasn't given up. But there's a new element here, clearly, as well. He uses a letter, a letter to thwart his leadership. But notice this time it's an open letter. Now, in his day, an open letter was literally what it sounded like. It was a written instrument that had not been sealed, not been closed. Usually when a letter was written from one party to another, it had to be delivered by hand. A messenger had to carry it from one spot to the next. It was written on parchment or whatever form of, of material. And it would be sealed often with wax or something that could prevent anyone, any prying eyes, from having a look at this document between the time it was written and the time it was received by its intended recipient. The courier was in fact tasked to make sure that it arrived without that seal broken. And if it was broken, the courier is held responsible by the person who received it. But in this case, Sambalat doesn't even bother sealing it. He leaves it open. He sends this letter open precisely so that the courier and any that the courier would encounter along his way would be able to eavesdrop on this conversation. And of course, once they've read it, they'll spread what they've heard to others and so on. And the word would travel fast. His purpose is to discredit Nehemiah as a leader before the people with innuendo. 
In the letter, he impugns his motives and his purposes. He says that Nehemiah is assuming leadership over the city and its rebuilding process because it's a plan to rebel against Persian authority. Once the wall is up, then the city is going to rebel. Furthermore, that Nehemiah has personal designs on becoming king of Israel. And this is all part of some grandiose, self-important kind of scheme. And then he says the prophets have been told to walk around and declare you're the king in the city now. And then finally, he says these things are going to be reported to the king of Persia, which is an implicit threat, of course. Samballot's purpose in that threat is also clear that the people of Israel are in danger. And that's the intent of the open letter. That is, this word gets around, the people begin to spread the rumor and the motives behind all of this, that they're at risk because of Nehemiah's uh, desires for himself, his reckless schemes and prideful desires. Breaking down the elements of the deception, first, Sambalat lends credibility to his accusations by creating the impression of multiple witnesses without actually having multiple witnesses. He says, I hear others are saying. No, he isn't. That's just a lie. No one else is saying anything. But it sounds like there are multiple sources, which makes the accusation seem all the more credible. So often what you and I hear is something that comes in this form. I've read online. Well, then it must be true. I've seen it in an an email or so and so was telling me this. The fact that there's a third party involved in your conversation lends credibility to the accusation or so it would seem. That's the danger with gossip. No matter how many people repeat a lie, it's still a lie. But because many people repeat it, more people are likely to believe it, which makes it all the more dangerous. That's why we don't want to contribute to it. We don't want to contribute to gossip and in doing so give truth to the lie. We want to be able to distance ourselves from it. That's also why Paul commands that we would never accept accusations against a leader without independent corroboration of that accusation. He says in 1 Timothy 5.19, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. And in this context, a witness would be someone who independently can corroborate the accusation, not someone who simply heard it from the same person the first person heard it from. So the first notice here is that he builds a story built on innuendo and gossip and gives the impression of a vast array of people who know this truth when, in fact, there's no such thing. Rumors come to us under similar circumstances concerning our leaders. Secondly, the letter contains statements of fact or supposed fact, then goes the next step and impugns the motives behind the facts. He attacks the motives of the leader. He doesn't attack the actions because the actions are self-evident. Yes, a wall was built. But the question is why? And that's a matter of opinion. He takes the godly, righteous actions of a leader and he calls them something other than they are. He fills in details. He assumes motives. He creates a narrative to fit his view of the facts. There is no substance to anything he says. There is no other story. Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall to strengthen the king's power in Judah, not to thwart it, not to challenge it. And instead of wishing to be king, Nehemiah is content to serve as governor only for a certain time, according to his agreement with the king. This illustrates the danger of interpreting a leader's motives or heart based on someone else's interpretation of their actions. If someone of Israel agreed with Sambalet's assessment, then what they would do is reject their own leader, Nehemiah, without cause, merely on the basis of what one man's opinion is of the motives behind the leader's actions, when there was an equally valid alternative answer for why he was doing what he was doing. And that was the enemy's hope. That was the reason he made sure his letter was open. And we can't participate in that kind of speculation. And we must pray that the truth reigns in our church concerning what our leaders are doing. So the first thing is that he uses innuendo. Second thing is he attacks motives. Thirdly, Sambalet misuses the word of God to support his attempts at discrediting Nehemiah. He says he's heard that the prophets are saying that there is a king in Judah. Well, the prophets of Nehemiah's day were Haggai and Malachi. And these men were walking around and they were declaring the word of the Lord concerning the future for that city. And they were saying there was a king to come from Judah and he was going to reign in that city. That's exactly what the prophets were saying. But that wasn't referring to Nehemiah. And we know that they knew that. But Samballat takes that truth and he twists it to fit his lie about Nehemiah. That's literally the enemy's oldest tactic to twist the word of God to indict those who lead God's people. In the first case, it was Satan indicting the word of God spoken to Adam 
concerning if indeed he forbid eating any fruit of the garden, which is not what God said. That was a distortion of his word. And it left the impression that God's word was a negative, destructive, oppressive instruction when it wasn't at all. But it depended on a twisting of what God said, an impugning of his motives and innuendo. Likewise, here, Sambalat twists God's word and he tries to cause the people of Israel to fear Nehemiah's leadership, thinking it would bring them to destruction at the hands of the Persian king, rather than trusting that Nehemiah had their best interest and that everything he did was up front and exactly as he stated it. Nothing could be further from the truth of what Sambalat said. God's people must know that God's word says what it says. We must know it well and accurately so that when the enemy tries to distort it in an attempt to tear down our leaders or to tear down the word itself, we're prepared to defend it. And I can tell you as a teacher, speaking personally, I've endured occasions from time to time. Teaching I've done in the past might be twisted by somebody, but it's always done with an intent to discredit either myself or the ministry. And usually the point is to accuse me of mishandling the word of God by taking something I've said out of context and claiming it means something other than what I said it meant. But if we know the word well, then we're not going to fall for that kind of discrediting. And if we know our leaders well, we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And we're going to check the facts and we're not going to be subjected to innuendo and we're not going to participate in gossip. We do these things. We largely remove the enemy's power to discredit or dishonor our leaders, at least as long as they are themselves not doing something that's dishonoring, as long as it is truly just a rumor. Nehemiah responds with this timeless response. One of my two favorite things he says in the book. We covered one of them earlier. Here's my second one. It says, verse eight, then I sent a message to him saying, Such things, as you are saying, have not been done, but you are inventing them in your own mind. For all of them were trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged with the work and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah calls it like it is. He says, nothing you are saying is true. But I think the NIV actually captures this even better. It says, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. That's exactly true. Besides being an awesome retort, Nehemiah's statement serves as a great example of not playing the game on the enemy's turf. Nehemiah did not engage in a debate over his motives. He didn't respond to the accusations. He didn't try to argue with the lie. He didn't try to offer a different story. Because when you do that, you actually lend some credibility to the accusations. You give the appearance that there might be some substance there and that you may be just defensive for for reasons of guilt. It makes you look weak. The enemy does not deserve a response. We don't have to defend ourselves in the face of these kinds of accusations. If it is the case that they will be believed, then they will be believed. If it is the case that God will defend us, as we know he has the capability to do, then we don't need to defend in his place. We need to simply keep our head down. For if the defense of the accusations becomes our priority, then we fell for the problem of step number one. We fell for the distraction step. It's the same ultimate outcome for the enemy, no matter how it occurs. The Bible tells us to resist the enemy, but it doesn't tell us to engage with him on his own terms. When the enemy brings a voice to impugn the motives of our leaders, we need to follow the instructions of Scripture and wait for multiple independent witnesses to come to that same conclusion before we would even think to pass judgment. Let the single isolated accusation pass by where it deserves to go. In the meantime, don't expect your leaders to answer to the accusations with a defense. If they know what they're doing, they'll ignore it, too. It's not a sign that they don't uh, have a defense. It's a sign that they don't want to be distracted. What we should expect our leaders to do, honestly, if they ever get into a situation where something like this is thrust upon them, I hope to hear them say exactly what Nehemiah said. Sometimes that's the right response. So after calling it a fraud, Nehemiah appeals to the Lord for a defense. This is an important footnote to the entire episode. Nehemiah knows that the people may not be strong in the face of some of these accusations. He's worried that his leadership might be eroded by what the enemy's doing. He asks the Lord not only to stop the attack, but to strengthen the people against the temptation to believe the slander and to turn on his leadership. And he returns to prayer. And he's done this now time and time again. Every time he's challenged, he becomes this great example for us all. He goes appealing to God on his knees and then he promptly stands right back up and goes back to work. It's amazing how much work you can get done if you don't take time to deal with all of those distractions, but stay focused on the task God has given you. So in verse 10, we're back to the work. Now, the wall's been built, but there's still more rebuilding to do in the city, and there's more planning to be done. So we see that next, verses 10 through 14. When I entered the house of Shimeiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined at home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. 
and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you, and they are coming to kill you at night. But I said, Should a man like me flee? And could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that surely God had not sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalet had hired him. He was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act accordingly in sin, so that they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. Remember, O oh my God, Tobiah and Sambalet, according to these works of theirs, and also Noadiah the prophetess and the rest of the prophets who were trying to frighten me. Well, this is the third of the three tactics I said we'd see in this chapter. This is the third one. This is a plot to disqualify Nehemiah. On this occasion, Nehemiah visits the home of a Jew by the name of Shemaiah. Nehemiah says he was confined to his home. Don't overlook that. He has been confined. Now, he might have been confined for health reasons, but that, like a shut-in, but that doesn't really fit the definition of the word because this word in Hebrew usually means detained, as in a prisoner, which would suggest he's under house arrest. So the point here is that this is not an upstanding member of Jewish society. We don't know why Nehemiah was visiting, but it would appear that Shemaiah summoned him to hear a prophecy that he wanted to deliver to him. So he suggests to Nehemiah that both of them must flee. And again, it's a prophecy. So what he would be saying is, this is from the Lord that we do this. We must both flee because of this threat from Sambalet. We must seek protection from those who want to kill you. And Shemaiah says he is to believe this is from the Lord, and therefore you must heed the warning, and it is to go into the temple, past its doors, and shut himself in. Now, at this time of the at this time in the city's rebuilding, the walls are up, but the gates aren't, and that would mean that the temple was easily the most secured and defendable structure in the city. It may have been the only one of any size, for that matter. And much like Texans retreating into the chapel at the Alamo during the battle against the Mexican army, they're going into the safest place they could possibly imagine. At least that's the argument. In verse 11. Nehemiah responds by asking, should a man like me flee and could I go into the temple? He's recognizing the two aspects of this plot in the attempt to disqualify him from leadership. First, by fleeing from a threat, he loses his standing before the people as an example of faith and reliance on God. While there is a time to flee sometimes, Paul does it in a basket, for example, there there are times when fleeing is exactly the right thing to do according to God's will. But Nehemiah has based his position of authority in this particular situation in in leading the people on his model of standing firm. He's been telling them, stand firm in the face of attacks, fulfill your duty to God, trust God to defend. And then at the end of it all, he always tells God, defend this city as we need you to do. That's been his mantra. That's been his example. How many times have we heard him praying for that, uh, for the defense of the city? How many times has he appealed to the people? Wait on God. God will defend us. So what do you think the effect would have been if Nehemiah had turned tail and ran at the suggestion that he was going to be killed by some of God's enemies? It calls into question everything he said. You know, hypocrisy is a dangerous thing. That's why leaders are called to the highest standards of conduct in their service to God's people. The leader has no power to compel godliness in others while he himself is modeling sin in his own life. And a teacher cannot hope to persuade others to obey the call of God in his word while he's failing to obey it himself. The hypocrisy completely neutralizes any power in the message. We see that all the time. It would have been the height of hypocrisy for him to lock himself up in the temple, by the way, leaving everyone else unguarded, just to save himself while the rest of the city was vulnerable. And of course, even if he had taken this advice, what would have then happened was he would have removed himself from the action. He would have neutralized his own ability to lead the people because when the attack came on the city, he's locked up in the temple. It's as good as if he had gone off to Ono. He wouldn't have been there to to do his part to lead. It removes a soldier of God from the battle. And that's exactly what dishonoring or disqualification does to a leader. It removes them from the battle. It neutralizes them. It makes them ineffective and it causes people to stop following them. The war goes on, but they're left behind as a casualty as a result of of doing the wrong thing. So the first thing they want is for him to turn tail and run and become a hypocrite. The second way this plot would have disqualified Nehemiah is by leading him into a very public sin resulting from his pride and arrogance because Nehemiah has been asked to enter the temple, which he has no basis to do. If it says to go past the doors of the temple, it means going into the holy place, which is the only place that had a door in front of it. 
And it's there is a limit imposed by law on who may go past the doors of the temple. And it's only the priesthood. So when Shehemiah suggests Nehemiah enter past the doors, he's telling him, you and I go into the holy place of the temple to hold up against these enemies. The law stipulated only a priest could do that. Nehemiah is not of the tribe of Levi. He has no rights to enter the holy place. If he had taken that advice, he would have been knowingly violating the law of God without cause in a very dramatic fashion. And by the way, there are times when men cross these boundaries as established in the law with the approval of God. There's that moment when David ate the showbread that's reserved for the priesthood. It's not as though there can't be times when God makes that possible. But in this case, Nehemiah is acting in sin because God has not given him permission to take such an extreme step. Notice in verse 12, Nehemiah realizes that this is a prophecy, not from God, but from his enemies. Therefore, not a prophecy at all. It's a lie intended to entrap him. So were Nehemiah gullible enough to accept the advice that Shemiah gave him, he would have been sinning in a very serious and in a very public way. And the people would have rightly interpreted his sin as a reflection of arrogance and of pride. Who thinks themselves worthy enough to violate the law of God and to walk into the temple's holy place? At that point, he would have lost all support from amongst the people. He would have been disqualified as their leader. But it's important to note the order of the events from verse 11 to verse 12. It's only after Nehemiah rejects the suggestion that he then comes to understand that the prophecy is no prophecy at all. The order of these events is important. It demonstrates an important principle of how God works in all of us in the face of the enemy's schemes. God waited for Nehemiah to make the right choice based on the knowledge that was already available to him in the word of God before the Lord then revealed the backstory on what was happening. Even before Nehemiah was made aware that the prophecy was a trick, he knew enough to understand out of God's word that what Shimeiah was saying was not in accordance with God's will and therefore it was a lie. And it depended on his knowledge of God's word, combined with his own common sense and and maturity, to reject that suggestion. Once he comes to that right conclusion, then the Lord confirms his choice by giving him insight to know that the man was hired to attack him. What the Lord wanted was to have Nehemiah confident in his decision, knowing that the Lord was behind him. But that can't be a substitute for following what God has already provided to us for the sake of righteousness. God will typically allow us to work through a test like this. Without any special revelation, no burning bushes, no voices from heaven, because he's already given us all that is required for godliness in the word of God through the spirit. Peter says in Second Peter one verses two and three, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And then he says, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, through the knowledge of him, the word Christ. And it's represented in the pages of the Bible to us now. So how do you become godly? How do you know how to follow God properly? You already have it in your lap. It's the word of God. Before the Lord is going to move to give us any more revelation on top of what he's already given us, he waits to see if we're willing to use what he's already provided. Meanwhile, notice how the enemy works to undermine our trust in God's word. Shemaiah called to Nehemiah claiming to have a word from the Lord. How often has the enemy pulled that trick out of his bag? I've got a word for the Lord from the Lord for you, right? And every time the enemy is making an appeal to our flesh with a phrase like that or with a call like that, by enticing us with something special and miraculous and mysterious, secret, right? He knows that if our choice, if our flesh's choice is between heeding the word of God delivered through prophets centuries ago how boring is that or receiving an exciting divine revelation delivered special delivery from god to you well then our flesh is always going to prefer the latter because it's just so much more enticing but our flesh is self-destructive and easily manipulated by that kind of nonsense and the enemy knows that so he uses that we must be trained by scripture itself to turn aside from special revelation or a word from the lord especially when those things go against what we know Scripture has. When we do this, we become trained in how to distinguish truth from nonsense. By the study of God's Word, we become trained in how to make that discernment. And the writer of Hebrews says that. In Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, he says, 
to a group who were not doing this properly. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God or the word of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. And then he says this, the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. The practice there is the practice of study in God's word. So Nehemiah was trained in God's word. So he rejected the bad advice. And as he did, then the Lord revealed to him that this man could not be trusted at all. Don't forget that order. Notice in verse 13, Nehemiah correctly concludes this tactic was intended to cause him to act out of fear rather than out of faith. That's what it would have been if he had turned and run. If he had gone into the temple sinning as that would have been, he would have been acting in fear. Pure and simple. He couldn't have been acting based on conscious thought and deliberate consideration because those things would have brought him to an opposite conclusion. The only conclusion, the only way you get into the temple under these circumstances is because you're too afraid to think for yourself. Acting out of fear is a sin in Scripture because it is the antithesis of walking in faith. The Bible doesn't say being afraid is sin. It condemns allowing fear to rule our hearts and decide our actions. Secondly, Nehemiah understood that the scheme hoped to drive him into sin and that would discredit him before the people and he worried too much about his witness and his opportunity to lead. That he would be willing even to take the risk of his life rather than to discredit his honor and his leadership and save his physical life, right? Jesus says those who wish to save their lives will lose it. And he's referring to an eternal loss for an earthly gain. Now you can see why it's so important that our leaders remain vigilant against the schemes that try to discredit them. And notice in verse 14, Nehemiah mentions there were other prophets. There was even a prophetess who tried to trip him up with so-called words from the Lord. This isn't an isolated attack, in other words. So imagine all the ways the enemy must have tried to create fear and give a false word to Nehemiah through some period of time of building in that wall, all the while hoping to discredit him as a leader. And I think the fact that there's a woman involved, a prophetess, might indicate that a sexual trap was among the schemes. I'm not saying that's a given, but it might have been. We need to pray for our leaders to be wise and brave in the face of this nonsense. And we need to be prepared for the attacks ourselves because there's going to be a day when many of us might be called to be leaders on some scale, in some context. And I assure you, as soon as you move into a role of leadership at any level, you put a big bullseye on your back and the enemy takes full advantage. Nothing to be uh, afraid of, not something to stop your leading, but something to be prepared for. So Nehemiah puts all of this in God's hand at the end. He asks him to remember the evil deeds of these people. Important to remember that as well. He didn't bother with revenge. Here again, getting caught up in the revenge against your enemies is just yet another way to be distracted off of the mission that you've been given in ministry. Let it go. Trust God to take revenge in the proper time. Don't become distracted by the scheme or by the pursuit of the guilty. Leave it all to God. Get back to the work he has called you to do. And then to end this chapter, verse 15. So the wall was completed on the 25th of the month of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard of it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Also, in those days, many letters went from the nobles of Judah to Tobiah and to Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arah, and his son, Johanan, had married the daughter of Meshalem, the son of Berechiah. Moreover, they were speaking about his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. Then Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. Well, remarkably, the people complete this wall in 52 days. That's something you often hear noted out of the book of Nehemiah is this rapid completion. Even under ideal circumstances, that would have been a remarkable feat. Considering how long the wall sat in disrepair while the city was occupied by the Jews in the exile, the speed of this work is both a testimony to God's power, but it's also an indictment of Israel's disobedience during all those years. They've lived here for nearly 100 years. Without a wall, after having returned from exile, all of that time they suffered attacks, they suffered harassment, they lived in fear. And all of that time, all of that 100 years, they were 52 days away from a wall. 
The speed of that effort testifies to God's power as the people of the land acknowledged. In verse 16, the people around the city declare the greatness of Israel's God, having seen that wall go up so quickly. And that's the point, by the way, of this whole exercise. That one verse explains the point of this entire exercise. God's people are called to accomplish a great work and they're given a leader and they're given teachers so that the result of that work is a witness to God's power. And through that witness, the world testifies to his honor, to his glory. That always has to be our aim in serving God. And then Nehemiah ends this chapter with this footnote. Another example of the adversity he faced, this time through the other of those enemies we've heard mentioned, Tobiah. The name Tobiah is a Jewish name. And this man appears to have been working all the while to drive a wedge from the inside as a member of Israel to drive a wedge between the nobles of Israel and Nehemiah. And he's doing it through this letter writing exercise back and forth. Now, we don't know what the contents of all those letters were. Nehemiah doesn't tell us the contents of the letters. What he does tell us is that these nobles in Israel were beholden to Tobiah through family connections, through marriage. So Tobiah tries to use and leverage those connections to compel the nobles to commend him, to commend Tobiah to Nehemiah so that when Tobiah met with him, he could have greater influence over him. So this is one of those things where somebody wants to influence someone else and they go through an intermediary and they say, tell your friend that I'm trustworthy and that whatever I say, he should believe. Ultimately, that effort failed as well. But it goes to show the immense pressure Nehemiah experienced throughout the project and not only from outside the camp, but from Jews who were compromised and living inside the camp. As I read through this account and as I ponder that 52 day number, it causes me to wonder what accomplishments for God lie just 52 days away from me. What impossible task, what seemingly insurmountable challenge is actually more achievable than I might imagine? Where has the Lord brought leadership into my life that would spur me onward so that I might finally achieve that thing that's been waiting for me for so long? What encouragement it is to know that when you do take that step of faith in a new direction, the outcome doesn't depend on us. It depends on the power of God, and it may be a lot quicker to to happen than you think it will. And are we hesitating to serve God in some way because the enemy has succeeded in distracting us or deceiving us or perhaps discrediting us along the way? And that's left us sidelined and we live in fear or doubt or weariness. Well, if that's you, I want you to consider that your success may be only 52 days away. In 52 days, so to speak, you might be living in peace and in security that you may only need to take a step of faith to see that process begin and that God is more than capable to bring the leader you need when the time comes or the teacher or whatever provision you need. As with the priests who tried to cross the Jordan carrying that heavy ark, a book of Joshua, they're faced with a water in the Jordan River, too heavy to, to walk through and too high to cross and the fear of dropping the ark and all that comes with it. And yet they're told to step into the water. And it says in Joshua 3:14. So when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and when those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan, and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest, the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. And those which were flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on the dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. With the wall finished, it comes time for the people to celebrate and to enjoy the fruit of their labor by moving into the city. And although you see a huge chapter in front of you, believe it or not, we're going to finish that chapter in just a few minutes. Verse one through three. Now, when the wall was rebuilt and I had set up the doors And the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. Then I put Hananiah, my brother, and Hananiah, the commander of the fortress, in charge of Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. Then I said to him, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are standing guard, let them shut and bolt the doors. Also appoint guards from the inhabitants of Jerusalem, each at his post and each in front of his own house. So this is the point at which the city is beginning to be reoccupied. First, he gives instructions on how to secure it. That seems sort of obvious, wouldn't you think? But honestly, this is a generation of Israel who's never lived in a walled city. They were born here for the most part. And after living in an unwalled city for so long, they needed training on how to operate the gates. And he says, gates that remain closed at night, don't open them for any reason. 
and only until the sun is high enough to be hot. That's the safe plan. So only in daylight hours is the city open for business. And then he appoints other men to guard at various points in the city and one man to oversee it all, men that he trusts. Because what a shame it would be for such a a large and great project to take all of that great work and to put it in the hands of untrustworthy men. Many a great work of God's people has come to ruin when a great builder was followed by an incompetent steward. With the city walls built and the security of the city established, Nehemiah now needs a way to occupy the city. You have a city with a wall around it in a place that hasn't had such a thing for quite a while. Pretty much everyone and anyone who lives anywhere within sight of this place is going to want to get inside that wall and enjoy the security that it offers. But this isn't a city of all nations. This is a city of one nation. And just as with the original exile group that left under Zerubbabel, the Jews want to ensure that only those who are truly Jewish would receive a portion of the land inside the city. So Nehemiah, we're told, is going to search a list of names from among the original exiles. This is the list that was produced under Ezra. And when he finds it, he reads through it, and it becomes the basis for entrance into the city. This is the invitation list, if you will, for which families are seen to be the original families and therefore eligible to enter. And let's read now verses 4 through 72. Verse 4, Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not built. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the people to be enrolled by genealogies. Then I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up first, in which I found the following record. These are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away and who had returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his city, who came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rahamiah, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Meshpereth, Bigvi, Nuhum, Bahana, the number of men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parush, 2,172, the sons of Shephatiah, 372, the sons of Arah, 652, the sons of Pahath Moab, of the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 845. The sons of Zakiah, 760. The sons of Inui, 648. The sons of Babai, 628. The sons of Asgad, 2,322. The sons of Adonikam, 667. The sons of Bigvi, 2,067. The sons of Adon, 655. The sons of Atur, of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Hashim, 328. The sons of Bezai, 324. The sons of Harif, 112. The sons of Gibeon, 95. The men of Bethlehem and Natafoth, 188. The men of Anathoth, 128. The men of Beth, Azmaveth, 42. The men of Kariath, Jerim, Shippara, Beruth, 743. The men of Ramah and Geba, 621. The men of Mikmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 123. The men of the other Nabo, 52. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Hiram, 320. The men of Jericho, 345. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Onan, 721. The sons of Sena'a, 3,930. The priests, the sons of Jediah, the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Emir, 1,052. The sons of Pashur, 1,247. The sons of Hiram, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua, of Kadmiel, of the sons of Hadavah, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ater, the sons of Talmon, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatita, the sons of Shabiah, 138. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasufa, the sons of Tabauth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sia, the sons of Paddan, the sons of Lebanon, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Shammai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gedel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Rehaiah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazam, the sons of Uzzah, the sons of Paseah, the sons of Besai, the sons of Mehunim, the sons of Nefushesim, the sons of Bakuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harhur, the sons of Basleth, the sons of Mehida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Bakos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tamah, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hatapha, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Sophereth, the sons of Perida, the sons of Jahala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gedel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pokereth, Hazabaim, the sons of Ammon. 
All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. These were they who came up from Tel Melah, Tel Harsha, Sherub, Adan, and Emer. But they could not show their father's houses or their descendants, whether they were sons of Israel. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. Of the priests, the sons of Hobaiah, the sons of Hakuz, the sons of Barzillai, who took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gideite, and was named after them. These searched among their ancestral registration, but it could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. The governor said to them that they should not eat from the most holy things until a priest arose with Urim and Thummim. The whole assembly together, 42,360, besides their male and their female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 245 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, their donkers... <laughs> donkers. Their donkeys, 6,720, some from among the heads of fathers' households gave to their work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 gold drachmas, 50 basins, 530 priests' garments. Some of the heads of the fathers' households gave into the treasury of the work 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,200 silver minus. That which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,000 silver minus and 67 priests' garments. Well, we commented all through this chapter back when we did it in Ezra 2. So I'm not going to take any time to do that here again. If you missed it, it's online. Instead, we only need to briefly consider the purpose of the retelling of this here now in Nehemiah. And of course, it's all recorded here as it was originally written because Nehemiah read this exact thing to the people, which is why we see it here. First, this list established which families in his day had the right stand of the city, as I said. So when he reread the list, He's demonstrating that God's word will reign in this city, that those who will be in this city are those God intended. And it's the same group he intended when he brought them in a hundred years earlier, that the gap in time between when he said it and when it's happened doesn't change the fact that it was going to happen. And that's the second purpose in this. It reflects the faithfulness of God. These people are the children and the grandchildren and maybe the great grandchildren of those first exiles. They're hearing their family names read. And yet here they are now experiencing the faithfulness of God to fulfill the promise he gave to those ancestors that one day they would re-inhabit this city with its walls, with its temples, even though when it was first, when they first arrived, it was just rubble. Now, the time required for that fulfillment, about 100 years, was not the result of God's unfaithfulness. It was the result of the people's disobedience and their delay, not God's delay. But that in itself is a lesson. Despite their disobedience, God's faithfulness never waned. He remained true to his word. And think what happened in that hundred years. He sent prophets saying, get off your rear and start building again. He sent teachers to tell them how important it was that they get organized and do the work. He sent leaders to ensure the work would get done. He worked with them through the whole process. He even foretold the delay in the book of Daniel in chapter nine, when he counted out the years that would be required to rebuild the city. He included the years of the delay in the prophecy of Daniel chapter nine. But now the people can see the power of God to keep promises over time and over distance from generation to generation. Not even the disobedience of people will thwart the will of God and his faithfulness. Hallelujah, by the way. Lastly, verse 73. Now the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants and all Israel lived in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the sons of Israel were in their cities. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the reminders that we pray for our leaders, that their jobs are difficult, that the enemy is working against them at all times, and that we depend so much on their work in the body that it matters to us what happens to them, even as they work to care for us. I pray, Lord, we would help through our prayers sustain them from deception, from distraction, and from dishonoring activities that would disqualify them. Let them stand firm, Father, in the place place that you've put them. Let them remain focused on the work. And if it be us in those positions, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would be with us through those moments, strengthening us as only you can. And ask, Father, as we go forward in this study and come to its conclusion in in the timing you've allowed, that you might give us a few who would join us in these last weeks and learn what you've called them to learn. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.